Good morning. Um, great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sabine and Adam, for that most elegant introduction. I'd like to meet those interesting people. <laughs> um, I always feel that after those introductions, only one thing is certain. You are destined to disappoint. Anyway, I'm really glad that you could all be here, and of course that explains the heavy security in the area. <laughs> um, and jo John carries on later. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I like the introduction, Adam. Here's the real truth. Rob has spent most of his adult life in the salt mines of London Business School. <laughs> <clears throat> I have ventured away from the groves of academe. Like you, I have dirt under my fingernails. <laughs> I've fired people. I've hired people. I've been disappointed by people. Um, I've encountered cross-cultural difficulties. Uh, and it was a blast, by the way. So as the day goes on, by the way, um, Rob and I are both committed to the idea that there is nothing as practical as a good theory. So we are relentlessly theoretical. But the point of good theory, of course, is to connect with practice. So as the day evolves, the real question will be, and it will be explored with our colleagues from Eti Kani, Barclays, and Novo Nordisk, is what does this mean for real? Does this, does this have any traction on the world? Or as Karl Marx elegantly puts it, the world is sufficiently interpreted. The point is to change it. There you are. That's a nice sociological thought to begin the day. <laughs> I, I've always wanted to mention Karl Marx at a London Business School event. <laughs> It, it seems deeply sacrilegious, doesn't it? In, in the high temple of capitalism, to mention the man from Trier. Um, anyway, uh, Adam has um, stolen most of our opening lines, but never mind. Um, uh, a little while ago, we wrote a book called Why Should Anyone Be Led By You? <coughs> and it was based on an article that we wrote in Harvard Business Review of the same title, which we're pleased to say won the McKinsey Prize for the best article in Harvard Business Review. And we always like to mention this, by the way, because Europeans very, very rarely win it. And we'll almost certainly never win it again. <laughs> Though we have come second since. And if you're someone like me and Rob, coming second is worse than not being in the competition in the first place. The reason it won, I think the article is quite good, by the way. I mean, I, you know, I give it 7 out of 10. It's good. But the reason it won is it's got a good ending. It says, if you want to be a more successful leader, be yourself more with skill. Ta-da. Five words. No more sending people to the SEP at London Business School. No more massively expensive learning and development interventions. Five words. Five words. <laughs> That message has resonated quite well. Though I think it's worth noticing that you'd think that clever people could remember five words, wouldn't you? They, they don't. They don't. So when you ask them, when you do follow-ups, and you say, well, you know, what do you remember about leadership? They say, be yourself. <laughs> they go back to the team and go, great news team. I found the answer to great leadership. I'm going to be myself. And the team goes, oh, no. We sent you to London Business School to be cured. You come back exactly the same. Sometimes it's worse. They remember three words. Great news team. I found the answer to great leadership. I'm going to be myself more. Oh, no. Oh, no. He was bad enough before. Now he's going to be himself more. They always forget the with skill piece. And that's why our view, by the way, is that <coughs> leadership is, a is an authentic skillful role performance. Now, that's a rather tense few words. It's an authentic, skillful role performance. Now, a rather serious, very academic point here. This is where the literature on authenticity has slightly bifurcated. The US literature on authenticity comes very close to saying, be yourself. Just be yourself. Find your true north. Be yourself. If you've been watching the Republican presidential nomination, <laughs> you will have seen quite a few people being themselves. 
The European conception, and in particular the sociological conception of authenticity, of course, is be yourself in context. See, the idea that being authentic is about behaving the same all the time is clearly wrong. We play different roles, don't we? Who, who behaves the same at home as they do at work? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope you don't go home and do this. Sabine, darling, the time has come for your annual appraisal. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've been very happy with the catering department, but there are one. <laughs> if I said that to my wife, I'd still be in intensive care. <laughs> and could you send the children in for a team briefing, please? <laughs> You're playing a different role now. Of course, if you were truly authentic, someone who knew you well could recognize you in the role of partner, parent, executive, HR director, dean. If they knew you really well, they could identify what the psychologists call your self-concept, which you take to every role you play. So we ended up with this five words, be yourself more with skill. And I think it's resonated really well. That book has sold very well, and I hope many of you have used it, and we find that people have stolen the ideas freely, which is, I suppose, one mark of success. Sorry, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> one or two people guiltily looking at their slide deck. Yeah. <coughs> But one rather clever response to this is, well, OK, Rob and Gareth, um, I get it. I, I get it that in order to be an effective leader, authenticity is a necessary but insufficient condition. Authenticity is a necessary but insufficient condition. But in order to be an authentic leader, I need to work in an authentic organization. And since I don't, I'll go on being the same effective political player I've been for the last 15 years. So about five years ago, Rob and I started to ask people, um, mainly executives, but I'd say not exclusively executives, mainly executives, by the way, because we both work in business schools. And so you know, your search data almost walks past your door every day. Um, but not exclusively executives. Well, you tell us what would an authentic organization look like. And the new book, Why Should Anyone Work Here? How to Create an Authentic Organization, reports those research findings. But there is a context to this. We're living in, in highly dynamic times. Um, this, this is our view, by the way. Uh, we're in the biggest capitalist crisis since 1929. And by the way, if you think it's over, you're probably in cloud cuckoo land. Uh, the same imbalances which gave us 2008 are still in place. In fact, they may be even worse now because, of course, we've done QE for a long time. That trick's been pulled. Now, this is a rather unique moment in human history, of course, because capitalism's in crisis, but it has no rivals, does it? Uh, how many advocates of the North Korean system do we have here? <laughs> One or two people from Comp and Ben. <laughs> That's a joke. When the blue light flashes, it's a joke. It's OK to laugh then, yeah? We might have a few closet sympathizers with the Cuban system here, but don't worry, it won't exist in five years' time. Havana will be back to brothels and casinos. So, rather unique moment. You see, normally, when economic systems go into crisis, they have rivals. Mercantile capitalism had industrial capitalism. Feudalism had mercantile capitalism. Capitalism currently has no rivals. Well, no economic rivals, anyway. It only has religious rivals. This is a rather unique moment. Um, so we've got a number of changes. The changing shape of work, which is very much an obsession of modern HR professionals, and coping with the world since the fall of Lehman <coughs> Brothers and the collapse of the international banking system. Living in a reset world. Rob, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can I just say I've been uh, 
following Gareth for about 30 years, and it doesn't get any easier. Um, I keep giving him feedback, he doesn't listen. Um, anyway, uh, it's very nice to be with you, especially to be with our guest speakers who are coming on after us with the case study examples. Um, Gareth sort of just explained how we got from why should anyone be led by you to why should anyone work here with this question of, you know, I'll be authentic when my organisation's authentic. But there's clearly stuff going on more broadly which lead us to the same question, and that's what I'm going to talk about briefly. And then both of us are going to get into this uh, model of the dream organisation. Uh, the first, just for information, the first time I heard somebody talk, use that phrase, living in a reset world, uh, it was Jeff Immelt, and, um, the boss of GE, and he was at London Business School, and it was just after the crash in 2008. And in public, he said, the world is resetting, and GE's relationships with its suppliers, its competitors, its markets, with regulators, with the developing world, with the environment, everything was resetting, and of course he was right. Uh, and then at the end of it, he said, um, and our understanding of leadership is resetting. And those of you that know anything about GE and Jack Welsh and Croton, all of you, I suspect, um, I almost fell off my chair when he kind of made this observation. And I'll come back to that observation a little. Our understanding of leadership is resetting. I think the sentence he used next was, we, we don't know what it means anymore. Um, and when someone like that from GE says it, you know, forget what the professors are saying, but when someone like him says it, I think we need to take it very seriously. Um, I almost fell off my chair, but... Um, I recovered. So I'm going to say a few things about the way in which the world is resetting. And one or two people in this room will have seen me use some of these numbers before, so you can't play this game. Um, and um, some of you will recognise I'm stealing these numbers actually from somebody who a long time ago actually worked at London Business School called uh, Charles Handy. I'm sure most of you have heard of him. Um, and this is something to do with the length of the old employment career. Guesses as to what it is? Who's going to bravely shout out the 347s? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm normally on the third slide by now. Any guesses? Silence. Length of the old employment career. 47 hours a week by 47 weeks a year by 47 years equals 100,000 working hours. It's a rather depressing thought. Uh, but I've got some liberating news for most of you. Most of us are working a 50,000 hour employment career. Um, I'm, talk I'm choosing my words very carefully. I'm talking about employment careers. They're shortening from about 100,000 to probably nearer 50,000 hours. Um, I'm not talking about work. Of course, most of you in this room, you'll be working forever until you're 97, actually, supporting your 47-year-old son who still hasn't got a job. <laughs> and your 137-year-old mother, who isn't dead yet, <laughs> and your company pension scheme collapsed 400 years ago. So if you thought Gareth was pessimistic, you know, meet me. But um, so 337, um, 50,000 hour employment career, and statistically, that's the way to get there, 37, 37, 37. Although, of course, that's a statistical fiction. No one's working 337s. Last time I said this in public, someone said, yes, they are. It's called France. Um, it's actually France on a busy week, if you want to get um, <laughs> technical. Uh, any French participants? <laughs> Would you like a coffee break? Or so? Sorry. Um, OK, so um, most of us are working 50,000 hour employment careers like this. 60 hours a week is probably a good week. 60 hours. By 50 weeks a year, I know you've got six weeks holiday, but when you're on the beach, you've still got the dreadful machine that you've temporarily, I hope, turned off under Adam's instruction. So 60 by 50. The only interesting question is, for how long are you going to live this nightmare? The answer is about 17 years. So the 17 years typically take place between the age of about 28 with your MBA from London Business School and 45, by which time you've either made it or you haven't. And some of you are just doing the arithmetic, I can see. <laughs> Thinking, shit, my career is already over. Um, and later this afternoon, uh, Sabine will be running outplacement sessions for <laughs> some of those present. But um, 60, 50, 17, and sometimes I do those numbers and people say, oh, God, Rob, you're, this is a huge exaggeration. Uh, of course, in one sense, it is an exaggeration. A huge uh, custom program client for London Business School 
uh, has been, still is, Nestle. I don't think we've got anyone from Nestle today with us, but um, um, and Nestle actually is a great company. I started that program and love working with them, and it's still largely comprised of people in three, 347 type careers. It still really is. Um, so I'm not, not, and it's a huge source of cohesion and loyalty in cultures like that. So, you know, the world is kind of complicated. Most of you work in organizations, I suspect, where the arithmetic is kind of fragmented. Um, and what I was about to say is 60, 50, 17 probably isn't exaggerated enough that increasingly you're in a world where a whiz kid will come to you from Harvard having had two years with McKinsey and they'll say to you they'll join you for three years if you're lucky before they move on to a very senior position with Bain. Um, well, I think that creates all sorts of issues in terms of where does cohesion and loyalty come from and increasingly, maybe, it doesn't come from the organization, and maybe it comes from the individuals that attract ind other individuals into that organization. I can't do all the arithmetic here, so I'm not going to do that bottom line, but that's part-time, uh, poorly paid employees that tend to work forever because they can never stop work. But um, Hillary, over the other side of the Atlantic, has been talking about the gig economy, which sounds kind of quite sexy, doesn't it? Um, and in a way, Gareth and I are in the gig economy. It's quite a nice place to be. Uh, on this side of the Atlantic, the dark side of that might be, you know, the zero hours contracts and so on. Uh, but that's my way of simply saying that Charles Handy's numbers are still kind of evocative, you know, 20 years after he first started floating them. And I think they remind all of us that the sources of cohesion and loyalty shouldn't be taken for granted anymore in the world we live in. And it raises up the agenda, this question of why should I work here? rather than somewhere else. So that's enough on the numbers. Gareth and I are here to promote our books, not other people's books, but anyway, we both think this is a great book if you want to look at this issue of social cohesion in a broader sense, written by an American professor a few years ago. Um, so loss of loyalty, loss of cohesion, loss of faith. Um, do you recognize this cultural product? <laughs> or the uh, inferior, in my view, American translation? But um, uh, you know, Gareth and I, when we first saw this, thought this is a peculiarly kind of English or British sense of humour, we were clearly wrong. It's been successfully exported all over the world, hasn't it? And we all know the office. What's the office about? This is a peculiarly quiet group of people, but what is the office about? Anybody want to give me a quick description? Shout, be rude. Culture. Culture? Anything else? Leadership? Here's one of the guest speakers. He's going to be on. <laughs> He's warming up. Yeah, culture, <laughs> leadership, yeah. Well, it's about probably poor leadership in one, one poor management, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the other side of the same coin, it's about cynical, disaffected followers, if we're talking leadership. Uh, why is it so painful to watch? <laughs> you reckon I, yeah. Yeah, I was in Australia recently, and I asked some Australian guys, have you seen this program? They said, yeah. I said, what's it about? One guy said, life. <laughs> Um, well, if you recognize it, you're in trouble. To be serious for a minute, if you recognize it, you're in trouble. Gareth and I aren't in trouble. We're in the gig economy. Uh, you people are meant to be running these places. And if you recognize it, you're in trouble. Um, and uh, Dilbert, um, you know, if you recognize, what's, what's Dilbert about? Cynical, disaffected followers. Uh, one of the best-selling business books in the world. And um, I think we're in trouble really. Um, and more bad news, you know, if you want me to get really heavy, um, you know, the, the modern era of corporate distrust starts with Enron. And if only it ended with Enron, we could probably sleep at night. But of course, it just went on and on and on, didn't it? Um, and it's not just the private sector or the financial service. Say, it's everywhere, isn't it? And it's public sector, health in this country, health service, BBC, local authorities, social, you know, it's endless. Don't get Gareth and I onto FIFA, because it could get violent. Um, and I never expected to end this particular side with uh, VW in the middle of it. As someone who's bought their products fairly consistently for the last 20 or 30 years, I can tell you I'm really upset. Uh, I said this a week or so ago, and one guy said, well, you're an idiot. Well, that's really depressing, isn't it? Um, anyway, um, we're in a world where all sorts of things may be going, and without sounding too dark, I'm not going to read these words out. Um, there really was somebody called Studs Turkel, 
uh, a legendary, um, if I die and come back in another life, I want to be called Studs Turkel. But anyway, um, he wrote a great book, Gareth and I think it's great anyway, called Work, uh, Working, Working, sorry. Um, and this is what he said at one part of the book. And we think this is kind of near to poetry, really. And this is what work should feel like. Um, and if you now think about engagement surveys around the world, clearly for at least half of us at work, it doesn't feel remotely like this. Um, so, and uh, of course, you know, when times, Gareth has kind of pointed out the crisis isn't over, um, times have been tough, haven't they, in various ways since 2007, 2008. So when times gets tough, that's when it really, you know, the, the, up the agenda comes the challenge of making work feel like this. When times are easy, it's kind of relatively easy, but this gets harder when times are tough. Okay, so I've been talking about things that have been falling, loyalty, cohesion, trust, faith, etc. Uh, what's been on the rise over recent years? Um, both Gareth and I are fairly cautious about easy generalizations about generations. So although we're showing this, we're not sure we fully believe it all. Uh, I've got two children, however, who are kind of in this generation, and I can recognize at least some of this. And many of you I can see in the room are nodding your heads because you recognize some of this maybe amongst your children or some of your colleagues and so on. And if you do, I suspect at least some of this adds up to a bigger challenge in terms of making workplaces meaningful and satisfying. Um, Adam has rather kindly referred to all the stuff we've written over the years, and um, we wrote a book a few years, years ago called Leading Clever, or Clever, and it was about leading clever people. Our colleagues, by the way, when we told them we were writing a book about um, leading clever people, they said, great, we look forward to the next book called Leading Stupid People. <laughs> And then the book after that called Stupid People Leading Clever People, um, <laughs> which is a really good title for a book, and we wish we'd thought of it. But um, anyway, um, we wrote a book about um, the clevers, and the reason we wrote the book about the clevers is that, um, you know, if you believe the stuff, which we do really, that um, many of us are shifting towards a kind of knowledge-based economy, in a knowledge-based economy, you should expect organisations more and more full of clever people of one kind or another. Now, we could have an interesting debate, couldn't we, about what does clever mean? Um, we came up with a rather flip definition, which was people who think they're cleverer than you and don't want to be led. And many of us, I suspect, recognize that and work in organizations where we feel we've got people around us who feel they're cleverer than us and don't want to be led. Uh, we came up with a smarter definition of clever a bit later on, which went something like this. People who are a source of disproportionate value on the back of resources which organisations make available to them. Sorry, that's a very long sentence. People who are a source of disproportionate value on the back of resources which organisations make available to them. And we use the word clever deliberately in a provocative way because we're sort of slightly fed up with the overused word talent. Um, and clever is a kind of provocative word, isn't it? You know, not as slightly double-edged, not as clever as they think they are. And the other thing about clever people is they often don't want to be in your organisation, do they? They're fairly anti-organisational. It's a kind of marriage of convenience a lot of the time. They're using you for resources or network or brand or reputation. I'm talking about professors at London, but sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, except for me and Gareth, who are quite different, but... Um, um, so, you know, um, if you move towards that kind of world, and I can see, well, some of you are taking little pictures of the many words behind me, and of course I'm not going to run through all these words, and you, you're casting your eye down the list. Do you recognise these? Are they familiar? So, yeah, many of you have been nodding your head as you look at this list. It's the reason why some of you are going grey or losing your hair or whatever. But um, these people are quite difficult, aren't they? And this is a list of reasons why they are quite difficult. Um, and if you work really, 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 really hard to try and lead these people well, I haven't done the last click, um, they won't thank you. And the reason they won't thank you is that sort of leadership, in a way, is sort of simply, or even the organisations, kind of not even on their radar screen. What's on their radar screen is their technical brilliance at a particular area of activity. Um, so that's why we wrote the book. And if you combine, you know, the rise of the millennials or whatever you want to call that generation, and the rise of the clevers, 
you enter a world where things are changing and expectations are changing in terms of what would a good organization look like. Even the idea of a kind of successful role model we might want to challenge. So I started with a little anecdote there about um, Jeff Immelt and GE. And of course, uh, frankly, f forgive me if there are Americans present in the room, but too much of the organizational and leadership literature is dominated by North America, uh, dominated by American business schools, dominated by Jack Welsh, GE, Jeff Immelt, which is where I started. And maybe we live in a world where we should start thinking about other kinds of people who look quite different um, from those ideas or models of what leadership and organizations might look like. I'm not going to time short, so I'm not going to talk about all four people that are pictured here. I'll talk very briefly about the people uh, bottom left and bottom right. The bottom left person, uh, the Google man, is uh, Kai-Fu Li. He was running Google in China at the time we wrote our book on Clever. Uh, we got to know him, and I spoke to him in China. And I said to him, what kind of organization are you trying to construct? in China, and his reply was, I'm trying to build an organization that feels like a postgraduate research department. That's the way he described his image of his ideal organization. That's a kind of interesting image, isn't it, for a, an ideal organization. And the man on the bottom right, his name is Will Wright, and he worked at that time for Electronic Arts. He's the man who produced uh, Sims, SimCity, and et cetera. It's still the world's most successful computer game franchise. Um, really clever bloke, probably the cleverest guy I've ever met in my life. And um, when I was talking to him in California, uh, I kept saying to him, electronic arts, electronic arts, electronic arts. And halfway through my interview, he said, Rob, will you stop? Will you stop talking about electronic arts? It means nothing to me. Uh, can I tell you, at this point, at the time I was talking to him, I think he was responsible for about 50% of the company profits, and he'd worked for them for 15 years. Let me repeat, it means nothing to me. So I think we live in a world where kind of um, our understanding of organizations and allegiances and identifications might be changing. Um, and when we wrote Clever, Gareth's going to elaborate uh, more on this in a moment, but when we wrote Clever, we tried to summarize some of this shift in the following kind of way, moving from uh, a world where we try to make individuals more valuable by kind of <coughs> extracting more value, and um, even modern sexy words like motivation and engagement. When you look closely, quite a lot of these initiatives are actually still about the <coughs> process which Frederick Taylor and the scientific management people 100 odd years ago, they'd recognize it. The extraction of value. Well, you don't need me to tell you, do you, that clever people don't like that feeling. Uh, they'd prefer the kind of opposite feeling. In other words, you know, we might be shifting to a world where we're trying to give value yeah. to people who are already valuable. And of course, that's actually, before you say it in front of us, that's not really a new idea. Goldman Sachs has been doing that for a long time. So has McKinsey and the elite teaching hospitals of North America and Oxford and Cambridge and maybe London Business. You know, you know, there are places which have been doing this for quite a long time. I suppose our contention is that more and more of us have got to play that game or enter into a world where we're trying to give value to people who are already valuable. So that's where we got to in terms of our, sorry, I didn't show the second line, uh, making organizations more valuable to individuals already valuable, I've said it. Um, so world turned upside down. Um, all of these reasons, the losses and what's on the rise, I think are our way of saying that this question, why should anyone work here, is an increasingly pressing question. It's not just pressing for me and Gareth, given what we'd previously been doing with why should anyone be led by you. Um, so are we the first pe people to ask this question? No, we're certainly. Oh, by the way, before some of you say this too for us, the answer to this question, why should I work here, for many people still, is to earn a living. Gareth and I do recognize this. Um, you know, we live in a world of you know, choice for some, chance and constraint. Um, but nevertheless, our view is, and I think it's a sustainable view, that for more and more people, uh, choice can be exercised especially for the more talented people that many of us are particularly interested in. So living in that world of choice, uh, this question becomes an important one. And over recent years, one way of answering this has been, well, I'm going to work here because of the culture of this place. 
Uh, our worry about the culture literature is it's on this kind of endless quest for the perfect culture. Of course, there isn't one, which is why we, a few years ago, you know, I don't want this to sound like we're promoting every bloody book we ever wrote, but uh, The Character of a Corporation, if any of you have read that book, was our attempt to, to talk about at least four, if not eight, different kinds of culture and their positive and negative kinds of consequences. So our worry about the culture answer to why should anyone be by it's kind of too mono, one-track answer sort of thing. Another answer to why should anyone work here is, uh, well, I work here because we win. You know, it's the kind of performance answer. Uh, this answer works very well for as long as you're winning. Um, when you stop winning, it stops working. Just ask Jose Mourinho. Um, so the performance answer also has its limitations. This is a sexy one over recent years. Uh, the employer brand type approach. And like most brands, the risk here, of course, is does the brand actually <coughs> deliver? And if it doesn't deliver, then again, you're in trouble. So despite these attempts at an answer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, look around the world and you'll see engagement levels, trust levels, in many respects at kind of all-time lows, uh, which means, I think, that our approaches might not have been really getting down to the core of the issue. So when we wrote our book and did our work for this book, we were trying to sort of dig a little deeper, really, in terms of uh, getting an answer to this question. And Gareth is going to talk about that process now, and then we'll get into the dreams kind of model. Thanks.